Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and a good morning to you all. We're here for the Lord of Venture Corporation Investor Presentation. This presentation is being hosted on Research Tree by Docio and Capital Access Group. Now, Lord of Venture is a, is a little different in the investment trust world uh, because it has an operating business on alongside its investment portfolio. And for this reason, uh, we had two presenters for you this morning. We have Dennis Jackson, who is the, the CEO, and we also have James Henderson, who is one of the portfolio managers. Um, as we proceed with this recorded session, investors will be in listen-only mode. We strongly encourage questions, which you can submit at any time through the Q&A tab on the right-hand corner of your screen. Simply enter your questions and press send. If you would like to leave feedback, please hold on at the end of the session and there will be a short survey you can fill in. While the company may not respond to every question during the meeting itself, be assured that management will review all questions and, where appropriate, publish responses. You'll find these responses on the event page on Research Tree. Now, without further ado, I'd like to pass the baton to Dennis Jackson, CEO of Lord Adventure Corporation. Very good morning to you, Dennis. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and and as, as Sarah noted immediately, we're a little different. Uh, and I think the first thing that we, we, the message that we need to land is just on the on the slide that I've got on the screen now. Screen now is Lord Adventure consists of two distinct but complementary parts. On the left hand side, there's our investment portfolio, which accounts for seventy nine percent of the net asset value, which is managed by James and and, and Laura Fall. And on the right hand side is the professional services business, which is 21% of the net asset value. Now, this bit on the right-hand side has um, reasonable margin, highly repeat and, and strongly repeatable earnings businesses. And over time, the cash that we generate on the right-hand side allows James and Laura increased flexibility in portfolio construction on the left-hand side. And we believe, and history tells us, that that produces material outperformance versus our benchmark over time. And while the IPS businesses might only be 21% of the NAV, over the last 10 years, they've covered 35% of the dividend. The other point to bear in mind from this combination of businesses is it's not one way. It's not just the professional services business allow increased flexibility to change. It's really important for com when competing for businesses in those professional services businesses to be part of a FTSE 250 very well governed billion pound market cap company. So just moving on to the next slide, we, we have to produce returns information that shows year to date and one year, but understand, and there's nothing wrong with those, but understand that when James and I are investing capital, we're looking to grow our capital over time. So where, when we're committing capital in IPS, or in James's portfolio, we're not thinking about one week returns. We're thinking about long term sustainable returns for, for the uh, owners of this business. And you can see from this over three, five and 10 years that we produce material outperformance versus the benchmark. Worth noting, too, that we've been trading fairly regularly at a premium uh, and we've managed to issue um, over 60 million pounds worth of shares in the last year and a half, closer to 100 million pounds in the last two and two and a bit years. And our OCR ongoing charges ratio are pretty low, just 49 basis points versus a sector average of 104 basis points. So just moving on to slide number three, this shows our performance over time versus people, funds in our sector that have greater than 500 million of net assets. That's why we chose this as the competitive environment. And again, this idea of growing capital over time is one that you can see that we have a, a, a long and very good track record of doing that. This I, the thing that James has been very good at teaching me in my, my five years here is if, I, if we grow our capital over time, then that gives us increased flexibility with respect to the dividends that we can pay out. And a crucial part of the Lord of Venture story is, is the dividend story. And as you can see from the table at the foot of the slide, we've been able to double the size of the dividend over the course of the last 10 years. Moving on to the next slide. Hopefully. So what gives us the confidence to be able to increase our dividend like that? What gives us the confidence that we're going to have this mix of 
stable but growing earnings. And Lord Adventure itself, and we, so the professional services business, we weren't great historically at giving our owners visibility. And over the course of the last few years, we've tried to do a much better job of increasing the amount of disclosure that we have around the businesses. And currently, we report in three segments our pensions business, our corporate trust business, and our corporate services business. I'm gonna take a few minutes to go through that slide. That's okay. But all of these businesses have strong elements of repeat revenues. And we think of approximately two thirds of these revenues of being um, repeat revenues. Um, and we've been able to grow the revenues in these businesses on a profit before tax basis by 8.1% um, compound. Uh, or actually 8.2% compound over the last five years, 8.1% was the number for last year. So let's get into the little bit of the detail. I'll start in the middle first, corporate trust. We were um, incorporated as a bond trustee 134 years ago. What does a bond trustee do? It sits between the issuer and the borrowers in, 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 in uh, the issuance of a bond. And during normal time, during peacetime, if you will, um, we get paid a fee to disclose financial information and that act as a conduit between the two. Happily, uh, in the current environment, a, a very large chunk of that is an inflation-linked uh, revenue stream, which is put in the contract for the bond. When a bond gets into trouble, um, our job is to look to maximise the recoveries on behalf of the bondholders with respect to the issuer. And at that firm, you can think of us as becoming a little bit like a law firm, where we get paid on a pounds per hour basis. And from a creditor perspective, we only need to do that work if we're indemnified or secured to our satisfaction. So we go behind HMLC and the liquidator in terms of the creditor tree. So the point being that in, in a time like this, we've got strong elements of inflation linked revenue, which I repeat, and we don't wish ill on any of our clients, quite frankly, but if things do get worse, then the, the opportunity set for that business can increase quite substantially. For those that, of you that know Lord Adventure very well, you'll see the period from 2009 through 2011, immediately after the global financial crisis, were actually very strong years for Lord Adventure, and that was driven by the corporate trust business. The other business that we have within, within corporate trust, which is very helpful to us and is growing quite nicely, is our escrow business. So an escrow account is just simply where two counterparties want to exchange an asset and need a trusted middleman to sit in the middle of that transaction and make sure everything is in order. Most of us have experienced that when we bought a house. We send our money to the solicitor, we send uh, our documentation to the solicitor, and when everyone's happy, the transaction completes. We don't do that for buying of houses, but we might do it for one of these enormous commercial buildings that is behind me here. We might do it in an M&A transaction. Uh, we might do it for a large pool of litigation monies that needs to be distributed. Um, and increasingly these days, and there's a lot of sport on the TV that we're competing with now, but we might do it for, for, for receipts for sporting events as well. So corporate trust business, strong elements of counter-cyclicality, high repeat revenues. Move quickly to the pensions business. So the pensions business, we've been a pension trustee for 53 years. Um, think of us being the non-executive director of a pension scheme. That was the guts of our business for the first 49 years we were in, the, in that business. Um, and pensions legislation in, in the UK and the pensions regulator is, is, is moving towards increasing the amount of professionalization that there are of trustee boards. Why shouldn't they? Because a, a well-managed scheme can produce materially different outcomes than a poorly managed scheme. So we sit on those schemes um, as a professional trustee. We only do that for about 200 schemes, and there are about 4,000 DB schemes in the UK. And increasingly, the, we're doing more and more work with respect to uh, DC or uh, governance as well. And as things move beyond DC into CDC, we're doing that, or collective DC, we're doing that as well. The other part of the business, which is new, um, but growing significantly, is, is in what we call Pegasus, but think of that as a non-executive part of supporting pension scheme. So we'll look to work with an in-house team potentially to pay on board the in-house team, and we'll set up meetings for the, for the pension board. We'll take the minutes of the pension board meeting, and we'll follow up on action items. We might do uh, beauty parades of vendors and so on. So we're doing an increasing amount of work 
to support the, the, the governance of pension schemes. Again, good amounts of, of strong repeat revenues. The last uh, element here is our corporate services business, which is in itself a collection of businesses. Uh, we've got um, COSEC accounting service process and whistleblowing. Starting off with COSEC, certain elements of that can be quite similar to the, to the pensions executive governance we talked about. This is organizing board meetings, taking minutes. Um, it's also doing regulatory filings uh, as well. Um, and it can be at the highest end, sitting in a board meeting and, and acting as a trusted advisor to, to the firm. So that mix of businesses for us um, it, it, um, is one that we've done for about 20 years, but we, we really um, accelerated it with the acquisition from Evershed Sutherland of their COSEC business at the beginning of 2021. We have a small uh, uh, structured finance business that does a lot of accounting work for, for mostly for special purpose vehicles. So a lot of finance companies might issue special purpose vehicles around credit card debt or mortgage debt, real estate. We do a lot of work to support um, special purpose vehicles there. We have a service process business, which is our least repeat, highly, but highest number of transactions business. Very simple business where we act um, as an address as required by UK law and US law in order to do business in those jurisdictions. For companies that want to do business under those legal systems and don't have to have an address, they need to appoint one, we act as that address. And then the last business, which is um, uh, our fastest growing, uh, growing business is our whistleblowing business. Um, frankly, if we I made a mistake here, it's perhaps buying it 10 years too soon. We bought it in 2007 and for 10 years, people said, let us know when that catches on. It certainly has. Um, these days, uh, there are parliaments all around uh, the world are putting in place whistleblowing legislation. It's becoming best practice for companies to have independent whistleblowing um, avenues open to them. And we provide those whistleblowing services. And again, even there, we're diversifying our revenues within that stream so that not only do we take the call, well, increasingly these days, it's a digital channel rather than a call that, that where we receive the, in, the incoming um, complaint. But also these days, we provide training uh, around that uh, to make sure that people are compliant with legislation levels. And because we run this exclusively with uh, a team of former policemen and women, where we feel that we have a particular advantage, we might investigate some of those um, issues that are raised. So collectively, strong repeat revenues um, and good margin businesses. Um, if we look at the detail that sits behind them, this is a little bit stale because it's last year end and we've just gone through a half year, we'll be releasing our results at the end of this month. But you can see that all of those businesses were growing <clears throat> nicely last year and <clears throat> they're not dissimilar in size. But the bottom piece there is the, is the important piece. We look to grow our capital over time. And the valuation of this business has doubled over the course of the last five years. And some of that is a stroke of a pen because we've increased the multiple on that business from eight times uh, or 7.9 times to, to 10 and a half times. But the point is the EBITDA that, that sits as part of that calculation has gone from below 10 to over, uh, over, over 15 million pounds during that period. So it's very much this focus on growing our capital over time which is at the heart of our decision-making. So in summary on IPS, high margins, good return on capital, um, good track record as well. My job, as James reminds me every day, is don't mess that up. And in order to do this, what, what our owners want us to do is they want our growth, our, 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 our growth to be sustainable. And sustainable in a modern way, but sustainable in an old-fashioned way. right? Sustainable, which is focus on excellence of product focus on, on growing a business consistently over time. And that requires investment. So we, we do invest a lot each year in our business in people, skills, training, technology, and infrastructure. That's a bit dull, dull stuff, but if we do that and we do that well, then we will execute well. And if we can execute well, then our business will be su sustainable over time. So with that, I'll hand over to James. Dennis, thank, thank you very much. And I'll, I'll go into um, the portfolio, but one first, I might just put it in context. Dennis very kindly says, I say don't mess it up to Dennis. Actually, his business has grown well in recent years, and it is a good repeat business, as he, as he says. And going round there, as I have since the 1990s, there's a, a real buzz in that business, and it's exciting to go around there. It's a, it's a growing business. Um, my job actually is also not to mess it up in that sense that you've got this business that's generating the cash 
earnings growth um, and we're paying it out in dividend. That's why this, the strong dividend record is there. We run a long list of stocks to try and diversify that risk. 150 stocks. And I don't apologize about running long lists. There's a good team at Henderson's. Um, I work with Laura and Olivia. There's a small companies team at Henderson's. There's a mid companies size companies team at Henderson's. And I use all of them um, to get to, to monitor and follow stocks. I was talking to the small companies team this morning about a couple of our holdings. And it, that allows me to run this long list. And the long list also allows us to have small companies in here. And small companies are out of favor. But running this long list, we can shift. At the moment, it has been the large companies that have has helped the performance in recent years. But the real value we are now seeing is in selective smaller companies. It'll only remain be part of the portfolio, but it will be a part that will help give the growth and returning to Dennis's point, it, the odd thing about running income funds is to grow the capital. If you grow the capital, you've got that bigger pool of assets that then gives you the, the, the dividend growth. Too many income funds, and I think particularly at the moment, focus on the dividend too much. And if you focus just on the dividend, you bleed the capital. We can run a lower portfolio yield because of Dennis's business giving us a third of the earnings, we can run a lower portfolio yield, which gives us more dividend growth um, and produce the, the dividends from the holdings that, that come through. So we, 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 we're hoping with this, this list of stocks to produce, produce more dividend growth, not just have high dividends. And dividend growth comes from companies that are growing. And there are in the UK and um, plenty of opportunities to buy growing companies the UK economy is under pressure, but there are, there are businesses that are growing. There are businesses that are rediscovering their mojo at the moment and will return to, and returning to growth. It, I, I keep, we keep saying, fund managers at the moment, we, we don't, you don't buy in the UK economy, you're buying a selection of stocks. And that's certainly, certainly true. But this results season has reminded me how well some companies are coping with the headwinds that they're facing out there and how some of the cyclical companies how disciplined they are how they've kept their costs under control and when a little bit of turnover picks up they will surprise with their earnings so that's why we run a long list there will be cyclical stocks in there cyclical stocks particularly smaller cyclical stocks are falling to very low long-term valuations and it's a real opportunity to pick up some stocks in that area. They will be the growth stories of tomorrow. But within this long list, we can we can slowly look for some of those. And we will and we have put on we have been a net buyer of we put in about thirty million into UK equities so far this year. And on weakness, we'll keep going further. We're unashamed about this. This is this is contrarian modestly contrarian investment management not being contrarian just to be difficult but being contrarian because when people tell you people over exaggerate and that moment people are over exaggerating some of the problems these companies are facing of late one of the phone call i get the most at the moment is from managing directors after their results they're saying i thought our results were really good and trading is really good but our share price has fallen why is that they say and I say, you know, that's the market at the moment. The, mar the market will recover in time if you keep producing your earnings, keep growing as a business, keep investing, as Dennis was saying, you you'll get through to the other side. So that that's the back that's the background of what we're trying to do. We're stop thinking of stocks. We will use other we use some other people's investment trusts. That, um, so we I think Herald, Katie Potts at Herald does things that we, and it goes into areas I don't know enough about. I, I, so we buy Herald when it's on a reasonable discount and we sometimes sell a bit when the discount tightens. I believe that fund has really added value over time. We, we will use other people's, we've got some a holding in Scottish Oriental smaller companies, for instance. It gives us a, a, an exposure to growth, small company growth in the Far East. We will use other people's products to help this overall mix, this blend that we think will give 
growth over time. So th 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 this, this slide I, I, I enjoy showing because it's not such a slide that many income fund managers could show. It, 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 our best performing share shares actually over the um, so far this year over the last year have actually not yielded anything you know, flutter is in a real growth phase um, particularly in america and it's it's not paying a dividend it's grown uh, the share price has gone up and if it goes too far we won't hesitate in in reducing it we'll have grown the capital if we then buy a yielding company we'll be growing the earnings as well so it's it's i don't have any it is, it is a privilege to be running an income fund and to be able to buy these lower yielding shares rolls royce will return to the dividend list from the prices we were paying that yield when it comes will be a, a relatively high yield marks and sparks has been a recovery story i was saying the uk there are companies that are rediscovering their mojo and marks and sparks would be one of them um on, on companies that have performed we've been disappointed with this year i got it got it wrong with direct line i believe they were better underwriters than they've proved to be um watkin jones probably falling with with the um the bond market um the belief that all some of these alternative um assets like um student accommodation will come under pressure but the, the um it, it, the uk is under pressure you can see in this this slide how cheap the uk market is I, um i've just got a slide saying that, that my that my volume isn't working We can hear you fine, actually, James. I see. So it was, it was only Dennis that couldn't hear me. He, he hears enough of me. So um, um, I'll, I'll keep going. And please, please say if there's any problem with, 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 with it. But this, this slide does, does show the cheapness. And you, people keep showing slides about the cheapness of the UK market. My favourite measure of cheapness is turnover to market cap. And turnover is the size of the business. And, um, and, and the UK turnover to market cap of the portfolio has never been cheaper in the 20 years I've run it. And I've, I've gone back over the last 40 years of the, in this portfolio. And it's never the turnover. For every pound you're paying for a company, you're buying more turnover than any time in the last 20 years. And that, that's, that, that, that suggests cheapness to me because it's a clean number. Um, there's no depreciation in there. It is, it is what you're actually getting. You're getting that turnover in the business. So the UK, we believe, is cheap in that way. Um, then this, this, again, just shows the resilience that is in the UK economy. The, the, the companies are performing reasonably well. This has been a good results season. Um, And again, the economic backdrop. I think people let me go on about companies. I, you can't get away from talking economics some of the time. Um, the in, inflation and whether it's got embedded in the system is very much the debate. I think there are signs that, that inflation will fall perhaps faster than some of the commentators are talking about. For instance, um, grain prices i was just looking at grain prices something like the barley price is back is it down 40 percent from its high um that that barley price those grain prices feed into chickens and then into eggs you know food stuffs are falling raw material prices generally are falling but and, but on top of that actually in the job market the um in the private sector the companies i'm talking to aren't giving away high wage increases everyone is grateful the people are grateful for the companies that to be in to be in work and the companies they're working for are they realize facing these headwinds and dealing with them and they're not putting through large pay increases so in, in our view interest rates won't have to go as high as the gilt market suggests and inflation will come 
come back maybe more more faster than 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 many people think and that it needs that stabilization of interest rates it needs it needs the belief that the next move of interest rates could be down and that will be the fuel for for sentiment in the market to improve and this is shows the yield on the UK market, and as I say, we got more growth of dividend. We're just we, we the, than most income funds because we are able to buy companies that are low yielding that are going to grow their dividend faster, or zero yielding, and are going to return to the dividend list. So what are we doing? We're buying some domestics. Um, they, they are the area that have particularly sold down. We're buying specialist engineers, as I said. The companies have got their costs well under control, a little bit of turnover, growth, and you'll we'll be surprised on the earnings upticks that some of these companies see. Um, and, we're, and where we're taking some profits in some of the pharmaceuticals, for instance, we're, we're, we're reducing to buy, to buy some of these other areas where we see more growth. Um, we're also being net buyers, you know, as I say, 30 million has gone into the market in the last um, seven months. Um, we will, on weakness, be buying more UK equity. The gearing is about 12% at the moment, and we will take it. We might take it up a percent or two more if there is if there is real weakness. Because, as I say, we don't believe that the interest rates um, will rise as fast as some people are thinking, and that on the stabilization or the belief that we've seen the last of the rises in interest rates somewhere out there that will be the catalyst people are talking about for a better market uh, just on the portfolio i put the the largest holdings there but it is this long list you'd see less concentration um than in most portfolios um and you see this weighting towards financials and industrials and that's where i see the value and in medium and smaller companies even on AIM, we've been buying the, the uh, select a few AIM stocks, which are particularly unloved, and where where the next generation of really good UK smaller companies will come out of is on AIM. The um, so that that I, I, I will conclude there. It is that broad list, long long list of stocks with growth in different areas growth in recovery of earnings by companies recovering their mojo like marks and sparks growth from an, an interesting area the alternative energy stocks if we're going to see a defossilization of the uk economy it will be because good companies applying new technologies come through and companies like ceres itm and afc are in the portfolio. They're a, they're a relatively small part of the portfolio. They're less than they're around three percent at the moment. But they are the kind of companies that could be substantially bigger in ten years' time. And you, it's unusual to see companies like that in the income fund. But go back to that principle that Dennis was talking about earlier: grow the capital, grow the capital with some of these companies, and you're growing that pot that's going to give the income and the growth of income over the next ten years. So I'll, I'll, I'll conclude there. And Sarah, you know, as always, I like any questions and any questions on Dennis' business, it'd be great to talk through. Thank you, James. And thank you, Dennis. Um, now, to everyone present, I encourage you to continue sending in your questions using the Q&A tab in the right hand corner of your screen. As the team go over the questions we've received so far, I want to point out that a recording of this presentation, together with the slides and the published Q&A, will be accessible on the event page shortly after this call. Now, uh, we do have a number of questions in already. Now, normally I would, I would kick off with one of my own, but, um, but one of the attendees has posed such a good question uh, that I think we'll, we'll kick off with that. Uh, so he's, he's, uh, he said, um, should we be thinking about IPS almost like a core 20% holding of the fund that provides ongoing low risk yield to the overall performance? James, what do you think? Okay, so I'll, I'll try that. Did it say no risk? Because um, no, I, no, I think no risk. when you say 
low risk. Ongoing, okay, low risk. Low risk there's, yeah. there's a difference <laughs> between low risk and no risk, right? So yes, uh, so so I think that that is a, a simple way of thinking about it. Um, and uh, I, 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 James will have his views. He's been managing the portfolio for 25 years, but certainly from from my perspective. Go back to what we said about not messing things up, right? Our job is to is to sustainably grow those earnings over time. But if, I think if you wanted to take a simple view, you can say 20% of the NAV is in this one investment, which is this collection of businesses. And over time, we're looking to grow our earnings within within that business. So that to me, that would be a very simple way of looking at it. James? Yes, I mean we we have we we joke, you know. I I think we, we I want to grow the earnings faster than Dennis. I'm failing at the moment, um, but because but um, there have been periods when the, the earnings from um, the professional services business haven't grown, and the earnings from the portfolio did grow, and it's it, it it's and that's actually added some balance to the overall returns of of um lord adventure because there are periods in every company that when things go sideways for a bit the investment's being made into the future and then there are other periods when you're making real strides forwards so hopefully the mix of the two the blend of the two um adds value in a way that turn two can equal five um for 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 the for the overall holdings company um and certainly I don't think you can say what what um, bit grows faster on a on a five year view. We'll it'll depend on so many things. The thing is, if we both focus on doing the best we can, if we both focus and remain disciplined, and we and we will we, the, the the overall cake will 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 get bigger, and not worry too much about the exact percentages of the of the two sides. Um, I I think. That there is real growth in parts of the UK coming through. At the moment, it's different. That the sentiment isn't good. And meanwhile, Dennis's business, we in recent years has has been growing in a more obvious way than some of the shares I'm holding. But you know, I believe some of them are going to come through, and could show substantial growth over the next few years. Thank you. Um, so another question for you, uh, Dennis, going back to that point about growing the capital, I guess. Uh, so one of our attendees has asked, how much of your IPS earnings do you typically retain for reinvestment in the business versus paying it out as a dividend to the trust? And also, uh, how has IPS earnings reacted to in previous downturns? So, OK, so two elements to the question, how much did we retain? Um, and the second one is how have we, how have we reacted to previous downturns? So retained earnings. I'll just take a note here and downturns. So let's do the downturns first because they're relatively fresh. Um, certainly, look, COVID was a difficult period for um, some of our businesses. The you know global trade fell off a cliff. So our service uh, and and in service of process business um, uh, in that situation, which is, as I say, that's the one which are least repeatable revenue streams, that had a difficult time. But against that, um, if you were in the pensions governance business, pensions needed to be governed. And arguably at a time when we went into COVID, um, you saw... Um, asset many asset classes were moving materially, whether they were bonds or um, equities. But many risk assets or, or many asset classes, all re asset classes, repriced themselves. Equally, in terms of communicating with members and so on. So there was an awful lot of pensions governance requirements. So, so we actually saw an uptick in in work that we were doing on the pension side, whereas we had an offset from uh, the, the, the service process business. But as a, as a portfolio of businesses, if two thirds of your businesses are largely repeatable, that's a good place to be in. Go back to the global financial crisis, uh, as I think I mentioned when I talked about our corporate trust business. Our corporate trust business in 09, 10, 11 was strongly counter cyclical. Now, the, the, the current situation we're in with COVID, a lot of central bank support was put in uh, around the world, which means that bankruptcies have, until very recently have been relatively low. Um, 
So one suspects, and again, I, I repeat the comment I made earlier, we, we don't wish any, any bad fortune on any of our clients, but one suspects that you'll see an increased level of bankruptcies because people have some, there are certain companies, certain sectors that have taken on a lot of debt at very low rates. And as they look to refinance them, they might not be able to refinance them or they might find the levels at which they can are, are not going to be uh, co consistent with a, with a healthy business model. So I suspect that there, there, there might, as we look forward, there might be more work for us. But I think the question was a look backward ones. How's that done? I did very well. So, again, J James said he makes no apologies for running a long list. The, the nice thing about even when you look in IPS, there's a diversified portfolio of businesses, even within those businesses. So I think, you know, COVID, global financial crisis, what we've been able to do is sustainably grow our earnings with the mix of businesses that we have um, during those difficult periods. Um, second question was, uh, or the first part of the question was related to um, earnings retention. Now, clearly um, we, we operate the um, uh, uh, IPS subsidiaries um, below the PLC. So these are in operating subsidiaries. And as an investment trust, when capital is in the is in the listed vehicle in the investment trust, we in order to retain our, our status as an investment trust, we have to dividend out eighty five percent of that. Um, so within the investment trust uh, each year, we we, we can um, uh, re retain uh, uh, some earnings. Um, and very much we have to, but it's almost a formula, but well, not quite formula based, but the majority of the capital that ends up in, in, in the parent has to be dividend out, 85% of it has to be dividend out. So, so we are a, able to retain some money within the operating subsidiary. I think when you look at this at, at a consolidated level, we covered our dividend um, uh, we, we, last year through, through earnings. We didn't use any retained earnings for the dividend, the 30.5p we paid out last year. Uh, and we have uh, approximately one year's worth of earnings uh, at that level in, in reserves in the subsidiaries. And, and the thing to remember is that it, at Holdings, Holdings can always send money down to Dennis. Um, if, it, if it wants to. So it's not just that um, the earnings um, need to be, a little bit need to be held back for the business. It, it can. So, um, and, and that has happened. That there, there is there's flow from Dennis's business up to Holdings, and there could be, if he needed the money, um, a flow back down again the other way. Isn't that right, Dennis? And no, that's uh, it's, it's a very good point. We, we talked earlier about the, 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 the two way nature of the relationship, right? It's one thing to produce steady income to allow James a, a different approach to, to stock picking. It's another thing to be part of a listed company that, that's this massive vehicle. And James is absolutely right. If, if we convince ourselves, like, for example, in the situation of um, uh, in early 2021, when we thought it was worth uh, buying the company's secretarial business, we got that cash to buy that from James trimming his uh, portfolio holdings within, within, within the investment portfolio. So it is very much a two-way two street, and the model works well. Great, thank you. Um, now, we've got quite a, quite a few questions. Um, one of them on politics. Um, so the, our attendees asked, from what we know of Labour policies so far, do you think a Labour government will be good for the UK stock market? I, I mean, I, I'd go first on this. I mean, I've, I've, I've um, as Dennis said, I've been going to Lord of Venture meetings for 30 years, I think. I think the amount of my life in those early part of the years, we used to debate about government, about politics, actually at board meetings. It, it added no value. There's, there's no pattern to it. You know, the Blair years were good years. Some conservative years have been bad years. Um, politics is there if a Labour government gets in um, I think it must probably be discounted is they're 25 points ahead in the polls or something um, so I don't I don't think it affects the market the market will go up I think interest rates and inflation are there what's happening in the in the world is more important than what's happening in in um, in in Westminster if if the global economy is growing and inflation is subdued. That's that 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 will be the background for asset 
appreciation. Meanwhile, if inflation gallops away everywhere and um, interest rates are heading up, we, we've got we got we got we got prob we're going to continue back headwinds um, in 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 prices. So no, um, we listen. I listen to what's happening in politics because you know there will be sectors that are affected. Maybe something like a utility may be affected if if um, if the anti feeling towards um, some of the privatised companies grows. Um, you will we, we'll need to be careful. Um, but overall, I won't pay too much. We won't be paying overly attention to which party is in power. Um, the, um, remember that the earnings of many of these companies comes from overseas as well as the UK. You get too fixated and too UK-centric sometimes um, when you read the papers in England. Um, no, so uh, politics will... It'll be what it will be. We'll focus on companies that are growing and focusing on growth. And if, you've, if you're an alternative energy company and you have the fuel cell that works, it won't matter which party's in power. You'll get a lot of business to do. And, and, and on the IPS side, again, I think we're, we're pretty ambivalent there. Um, business has been around for 134 years so, and, and has thrived during, during all sorts of different teams in power. And, and the pensions business is a wonderful example. If I, if I was to read a, a, a think tank with a blue cover or a red cover at the moment, they've, they've, both sides are looking to, uh, to, to bring in some legislative change with respect to pensions governance. Our job is to implement that change. So rather than debate the effectiveness of the change, our job is to be part of the conversation, um, but ultimately when that lands from a legislative perspective is to go and implement that. Um, so, so I think under similar view to James is, you know, um, don't, don't, don't waste too much time thinking about it uh, and worry about where it lands and, and uh, be part of the conversation, but um, make sure that we can be nimble around it. Thank you. Now, James, you, you touched on in, in your answer there, um, alternative energy companies. Um, one of our attendees has, has asked if you could talk a bit about serious power. Uh, he says, this has been a painful holding for me recently. And from your from your slide on contributors and distractors, I imagine it has for you as well. Well, it, it always depends on your start date. It's actually been on the five year view. It's been the biggest single stock contributor to Lord Adventure. Um, I had held it before. For, for, for a number of years before the five-year period when it hadn't done anything. But it went from 60p to £16 um, over the, the period till 2021. It had got overblown, and I can't say I sold any at £16, but I did sell some at £12 and £14. Um, so I was selling it on the way up. Um, I didn't finish selling it. I, 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 and I... I why didn't I? You know, I, I kicked myself for not finishing it. So it was people were discounting too much good news. You know, the, the people were looking too far forward. It was always going to take time. It always it always takes longer than you think to to develop new technologies. But um, and it, it it had run too far. But I had reduced quite a lot. So that's why it's the biggest single contributor over five years. We're now we recently we have been buying it back. I still believe in the medium term that um, the, the fuel cell will be part of the um, portfolio of things that will be give us this alternative energy. I, th I think the, 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 some of the partners that they've got are putting up um, plant, particularly in the Far East, and that plant will lead to very good royalty income in time. But these things always take a bit longer than you think, and the markets always get can get overexcited and then other times they get overly pessimistic and i think that's what you're seeing in the price underlying that huge swing in the share price from 60p to 15 pounds down to um two pounds three pounds that actually underneath the company is making steady progress it's the stock market that blows hot and cold and um we have to try and use a bit of that. Um, the company luckily raised money when the share price was high, so it leaves in a good position to live to get through the next few years and for that royalty income to kick in. 
Um, so hopefully when we next talk to that shareholder, he, he might be happier, but time will tell. It's part of a portfolio with us, remember. And, I, and it, 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 there will be within that portfolio winners and losers. Thank you. Um, now we are, um, I am afraid, running out of, of time. Um, so I will thank you uh, both for addressing all of these questions today. Um, should there be any more inquiries, they'll be made accessible to you right after the presentation for your review. Um, to all investors attending, we kindly request you to keep the session open as we'll be automatically redirecting you to a feedback form. Uh, the insights from this form will greatly assist the management team in understanding your perspectives and expectations more clearly. We sincerely appreciate your participation in today's presentation and we'll now bring this session to a close. Good afternoon to you all. Thank you.